Well, good morning. It is good to see you all. Good to be here. And thankful that it's not too hot. We, uh, we drove out to Kansas City last week, and at one point, the thermostat on the car said it 103 degrees outside. And that didn't include the heat index. They said with the heat index, it was like 115. I was like, oh. <laughs> so glad that our car had an AC that worked really good. So, <laughs> so then we come back here and it's like, oh, it's nice and cool again. So, <laughs> oh. well, thankful for AC that works in the house. So <laughs> let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for each one that's here. We thank you for this holiday that's coming up. And we thank you for the opportunity to uh, to, to serve you, to praise you, to fellowship with you and, and with each other. We thank you for our heavenly family. We just ask your blessings on this time now as we come before you to sing praises, to look into your word. Father, just speak to our hearts at this time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Do we have any praise or prayer requests at this time? All right, let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer then. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you, again, we thank you for this day, for this time to be here. Father, we thank you for the electricity and the air that's working and that uh, we don't have to have things so hot and humid in here. At this time, Father, we just lift before you our, our message as we have Labor Day tomorrow, Father. And so we have a topic today on, on the, the Labor Day holiday, Father, and the subject of labor and laboring for you. Father, I just ask your blessings on this message now. Pray that uh, you speak to our hearts and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 7. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. And it reads as follows. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that, wa that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, for we are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man that taketh heed let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. And of course, the focus that I'm going on in these verses is that we are all laborers together. We are laborers for God. And we see that at the end of verse 8 and beginning of verse 9. And as, as you know, uh, tomorrow is Labor Day. Here's that picture that I was telling you about. And, uh, got Rebecca there, Joe, Julie, and I. And as we think about Labor Day, there's so many things that we can think of when it comes to the word labor. Um, a woman goes through labor whenever she delivers a child. Uh, there are laborers that have certain jobs for a living. Uh, it could be carpentry. It could be, you know, uh, make, uh, designing and building buildings. Uh, so many different things. You see some of the pictures up there, firefighters. Uh, doctors and nurses and, and uh, bakers and uh, farmers and it just on and on. There's so many things about how people, various people labor and all sorts, uh, as with any sort of career or job, there's always a need of some sort of a, a getaway moment. Uh, speaking of taking a break 
or trip. Last week, as you know, Julie and I was able to visit Rebecca. It was a short trip, but it was well needed. In, in some ways, it was kind of like a, a very mini vacation. And during the travels, though, I viewed a, a video clip on social media where someone was sharing their huge need for a break. They were saying they need a vacation, a vacation, whether it's a vacation, a staycation, or medication. <laughs> I'm I'm more with that third one. I think I need the medication. <laughs> As brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we are all laborers together with God. As we consider tomorrow's holiday, Labor Day, is a celebration in the United States for those who have dedicated their time and efforts to be productive within the workforce. The holiday is the first Monday in September of each year, and is for honoring workers and recognizing their contributions to society. And we all, in some form or fashion, um, are part of that group, that lab labor group. Labor Day is an annual celebration of the social and economic achievements of American workers. The hol holiday is rooted in the late 19th century when labor activists pushed for a federal holiday to recognize the many contributions that workers have that they've made to America's strength, prosperity, and well-being. Uh, well the first Labor Day holiday was celebrated on Tuesday, September the 5th, 1882, in New York City. And in accordance with the plans of the Central Labor Union, by 1894, 23 more states adopted the holiday. And on June 28th, 1894, President Cleveland signed a law making the first Monday of September of each year a national holiday. It is appropriate, therefore, that the nation pays tribute on Labor Day to the creator of such of so much of the nation's strength, freedom, and leadership, the American worker. The purpose of Labor Day, in a sense, is to reward the workers for the job that they have accomplished throughout the year. Little extra besides the earnings that they get from their employers, a little bit of recognition. And as we see in today's passage, we will all receive our reward according to our labor that we do for the Lord. Why do we, why do we have to, to do labor today? It all stems back to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 11, and I got a little video here, just about two minutes long, and it's got uh, uh, Ken Hammond there, and he's talking to Kirk Cameron about so many things. Why do we have this? Why do we have that? And it all stems back to Genesis chapter 1 through 11. I, I condensed it down to basically the theme about uh, why do we have labor, why do we have work, and uh, let's take a quick look at that. Every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis 1 to 11. You start to think about it. You know, why, did, why was Jesus called the last Adam? Took the place of the first Adam, Genesis 1 to 11. Why did he die on the cross? Because of what happened in Genesis 1 to 11. Where did sin come from? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we die? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have a seven day week? Genesis 1 to 11. Why does man have dominion over the animals, over the creation, and not creation dominion over us, as many politicians have it today? Well, Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have to work hard? There's a doctrine of work. Where's it come from? Genesis chapter 1 to 11. Why do we have to work hard? There's a doctrine of work. Where's it come from? Genesis chapter 1 to 11. Why do we have to work hard? There's a doctrine of work. Where's it come from? Genesis chapter 1 to 11. Why do we have to work hard? There's a doctrine of work. Where's it come from? Genesis chapter 1 to 11. As you see, that one point was shared over and over and over. Why do we have to work hard? Why do we labor? Genesis 1, 1 through 11. Or Genesis, yeah, chapter 1 through 11. And labor was designed by God. And we see that in Genesis. Labor was designed by God. God formed it. He created it. He created man to tend to the garden. Genesis chapter 2, 
verses 4, uh, basically 4 through 15, and I'm just going to share some of the verses. I've also got it on the screen here and in your handout. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So even the Lord saw that somebody needed to take care of this garden to till the ground. Verse 8 goes on to say, And the Lord God planted a garden east in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Go to verse 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So there we see God designed labor, uh, work. Man was to dress the garden and to keep it. We're going to talk about that in a moment here. But uh, if you take a look in other translations, you see it on the screen here. Uh, uh, the New King James says that uh, uh, man was uh, told to tend and to keep it, the garden. The Darby translation says he is to till the ground and to guard it, uh, a form of protection, keeping it. Uh, the modern King James says to work it and to keep it. So he had to till it, he had to work it. There's labor involved. The Bible in basic English says to do work in it and to take care of it. So God basically had Adam work in the garden, to take care of it, to dress it, and to keep it. Now dress, that we see in the, in the King James Version here, it comes from a primitive word, a root word in Hebrew, uh, pronounced all bad, uh, all bad, meaning to work. This Hebrew word means to work. In many, uh, and actually in many senses, it comes. Uh, we get that definition from the Strong's Exhaustive Hebrew Dictionary. To be a laborer or worker of the garden is the ideal purpose. Man was designed to till the ground, and as we see that in verse four, till comes from the same Hebrew word that is used in verse 15 and expressed as dress, to dress the garden. Man was placed in the garden to till the ground, that is to dress it. In Genesis 4, 2, we see that Cain himself was a tiller of the ground, so it was carried on throughout the generations. Cain, Cain was a tiller just like Adam was to till the ground. Again, the same Hebrew word is used here to describe the action of labor, of the individual, the same Hebrew word is also translated into English as one who serves another. And Adam was to serve God. Adam was to serve God, and he did so by tilling the ground, tending to it, dressing the garden, taking care of it. Along with dressing or tilling the land, Adam was placed in the garden to keep it. Keep means to hedge about as with thorns. That is, to guard, generally to protect, attend to, etc. Adam cared for the garden. He preserved it. He looked over it. He watched over it. And we also see in scriptures that labor is good. Labor is a good thing. Labor is good. In Genesis chapter 1, four, verses 4 through 31, we see that God created everything from the light, to the waters, to land, the grass, the trees, the sun, moon, stars, whales, water creatures, birds, land animals, all the way to, on the sixth day, man, male and female, God created he them. And after everything God created, God saw that it was good. And on the sixth day, God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good. Not once was anything bad. Not was any, nothing was less than good. It wasn't just fair. It was all good, or it was very good. And as we already know, as we've seen, that God created labor for mankind to accomplish this. 
um, can also be viewed as something good that was designed by God. But anything that God makes, Satan likes to twist, to distort, to mess things up, to change the view on. And as a result of deceiving Eve, Adam freely taking of the fruit from Eve, labor has changed from a pleasurable experience to one with more of a burden, to a chore, to a challenge. Look at Genesis chapter 3, with starting at verse 16 all the way through chapter 4, verse 12. We're not going to read all those verses, but we're going to read a, a good portion of those. Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 16, says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. So here we see, in a sense, a play on uh, the word labor as uh, someone, a, a mother that is in labor. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Verse 17 of Genesis 3 says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I have commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Again, a different perspective of labor. Instead of giving birth to a child, He's laboring by tilling the ground, keeping it, and there's sorrow involved with the labor now. It's cursed. The ground is cursed. We see thorns. We see thistles. We see weeds and all kinds of things. And now you have to, as you have done your own home gardening, you know you got to take care of the ground. Otherwise, the weeds overtake the garden. Then you don't get uh, good fruit, or it's weakened, or maybe not even fully developed. So there's, because of the curse, we have to tend to the garden even harder than before. Thorns and thistles, it says in verse 18, shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In 19 it says, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. So we see that um, sweat, hard work, it's all required now. Uh, if you go down to chapter 4, verse 2, it says, And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. We saw that a moment ago, that Cain tilled the ground. And verse 11 of chapter 4 says, And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, again he's talking to Cain, about tilling the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. So he's going to work even harder just to survive, just to get the, the fruits and vegetables. Labor added to it sorrow, sweat, curses, difficulties. Labor became a challenge, but it is still required. From something that was good and more pleasurable to what we have today. But we also see that labor is rewarding. There's rewards for labor. Labor is rewarding. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in a day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So there was rewards to the labor of tilling and keeping the garden. He was able to eat. He was able to partake in, in anything and everything except for one tree. Adam was placed in the garden to care for it, to dress it, to keep it. He also had the benefits of it. He was rewarded with the freedom to eat anything except for that one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He was not withheld from eating the tree. That is, there was no barricade around it. He wasn't hidden from it. It was there in front of him, but he was just told not to eat of it. He's still able to reach out to it, touch it, and so forth. And we even see whenever Eve talked to the serpent that she said that we're not even supposed to touch the fruit. God didn't say that in the initial. He just says, don't eat of it. He was just instructed not to eat of it, for if he does in that day, he will die. 
versus spiritual death, separating him from a relationship and fellowship with God. And secondly, the physical process of dying began, which eventually did take place, did occur some 900 years later for Adam. All in all, Adam was rewarded with the freedom to eat and enjoy the fruits and vegetations of the garden that he labored in. There was a reward for that labor. And reward actually comes through reverence. Reward comes through godly reverence. Psalm 128 verses 1 and 2 this uh, is a song of digress that was written. It says, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. As long as Adam was doing what the Lord told him to do, as long as he completely obeyed, had obedience, and it was going on, Adam and Eve both were able to receive from the benefits and the rewards of the labor. As long as Adam dressed the garden and he kept it while they had proper respect and fear and reverence towards God, and as long as they did not eat from that forbidden tree, everything was good, everything was fine, everything went along very smoothly. And the two were able to receive the reward of the labor. They ate of the labor of their hands. And we also see that reward comes from righteous living. Reward comes from righteous living. Isaiah 3 verse 10 says, Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat of the fruit of their doings. A righteous lifestyle or a right way of living can only be accomplished through the help of God. As Romans shares with us that we are all sinners, that the penalty of sin is death, the wages of sin is death. We are not able to live righteously on our own. We need the help of God. And we also see that whatever is sown, that will be reaped. Whatever is sown will be reaped. Hebrews 10, 12 says, Sow to yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. To live a righteous or a right life, one must sow in righteousness. Sowing to the flesh reaps corruption. Rewards come from righteous living, which is developed from what we feed into our life, from what we sow. Do we plant the Word of God? Do we plant the Word of God in our lives, or are we obsessed with personal desires? What we sow, we will reap, and not in a small amount, but in lavishness. We also see that whatever is sown will be reaped in abundance. Whatever is sown will be reaped in abundance. Hosea 8, 7 says, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. So, Something that may be of a smaller scale is sown, but the whirlwind is a greater abundance. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So whatever we sow, that's going to reap in, in a multiple scale. If, if, you, if you do a small amount, You'll still get more, but not as much as if you do a large amount. A farmer plants seed of corn, and an ear of corn is produced with more seeds that you can plant. An apple seed is planted in a tree that grows multiple apples. Each year is grown, so more comes from that. Whatever is planted is buried with the intent that a great abundance will be harvested, and living right according to the Bible produces the reward in abundance. We also see that lab the laborer, those who labor or work, is worthy of their reward. The laborer 
is worthy of the reward. And see this little cartoon up here. Man has a sign that says, will work. And then there's a little asterisk mark for food, two asterisk marks. Down at the bottom, he says, by work, I mean do nothing. By food, I mean cash. Basically, he's asking for a free handout. But we see that uh, the laborer is actually worthy of their reward. 1 Timothy 5, verse 18 says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. A few other translations, as we see on the screen here, the New King James actually says the laborer is worthy of his wages. The American Standard Version says the laborer is worthy of his hire. We hear that a lot of times. The Darby Bible says uh, the worker is worthy of his hire, or the workman is worthy of his hire, and the Bible in basic English says the worker has a right to his reward. So we see here that there's a wages, there's a reward, and that whatever you work for, you're worthy of that reward. God will reward you according to your labor. God will re reward you according to your labor. Jeremiah 31, 16 says, Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for their work shall be rewarded. Galatians 6, 9 says that we should not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Verse 7 says that we should not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that will he also reap. God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love. God will, will reward your labor. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which he have sown towards his name. And we also see that your eternal reward is given through Jesus Christ. Our eternal reward is given through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's through him, through his work, through his death, through his burial and resurrection. Revelations 22, uh, 22, 12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Christ is bringing his reward to give every man according as his work shall be. Question for you. When it comes to the incentive or reward, what is that in respect of, uh, in respect of labor, what is that called? The incentive or reward in respect of labor, what is that called? Is it rent? Is it wages? Is it interest? Or is it profit? And of course the answer is B, wages. The incentive or reward in respect of labor is called wages. Wages can also be defined as some price which is to be paid to the workers for the labor contribution and the production mechanism of the economy. Furthermore, God is also interested in the non-ecclesiastical work that people do. We serve God when we serve others. Therefore, the Bible says that we should work with enthusiasm, as though that we are working for the Lord rather than for other people, and that we see in Ephesians 6, 7. Whatever your profession is, render your service as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord will reward you in addition to the reward by your employer. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5 tells us that servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Notice that part there, doing the will of God from the heart. Verse 7 says, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not unto men. Again, there's the, the point. Whenever we do anything, we're doing it for the Lord. We're not doing it for, for mankind. I, I had to serve sergeants and, and officers and other people that outranked me in the military. And some of them I couldn't stand, they, their personality. But... If I liked them or not, I still had to obey their instructions, their, their orders. 
and the way that I had to take a look at it is I was doing it for the Lord. I wasn't doing it for that man. Verse 8 says, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he is bond or free. Point E, a good laborer studies the word of God. A good laborer will study. He studies the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word workman is from the same original word as laborer that we see in 1 Timothy 5 verse 18. And it says, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. We need to be laborers for the Lord and without shame so that we can rightly divide Rightly dividing literally means cutting it straight. A reference to that exactness demanded by such trades as carpentry, basinry, and even Paul's trades that he did with leather working and tent making. Precision and accuracy are required in biblical interpretation beyond all other enterprises because the interpreter is handling God's word. Anything less is shameful and the word of truth, all of scriptures in general, and the gospel messages in particular. Our laborer for God is not in vain. Our laborer for God is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And just kind of breaking that down, we see one point is, be ye steadfast, and that means to be immovable. You're standing firm. You're immovable. Seated, according to the online Merriam-Webster Dictionary, steadfast is defined as firmly fixed in place. Immovable. Not subject to change. Firm in belief, determination, or adherence being loyal. A second point, unmovable means to be firm. Being firm or immovable. It's not able to be moved. The third point, abounding. Always abounding in the work of the Lord means to super abound. To super abound in quantity or quality, to be in excess, to be superfluous as uh, to cause to superbound or to excel, to exceed a fixed number of measure, to be left over and above a certain number of measure. Uh, the dictionary describes this word as existing in or providing a great or plentiful quantity of supply. It's like the phrase saying going above and beyond. I have heard that all my life. Go above and beyond. If you're asked to do this task, go above and beyond. Do more. Oh, hang on a second here. Don't just do what you're asked to do, but go above and beyond. Do more. Not just the bare minimum, but giving it all that you have. Ensuring that you give it your best and nothing less. Again, not doing it as unto mankind, but as unto the Lord. The fourth point is your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Labor means uh, it is equal to weariness or exhaustion from toiling. Remember, Adam had to toil the ground and wore him out afterwards after sin because that was one of the effects of toiling. An intense form of labor, uh, it's uh, in vain, is explained as to no end without success or result, or as in an inverted or blasphemous manner. That is, the labor is not empty, it is not shallow, it is not hollow, it is not without purpose or value, it is not without success. We must labor for the Lord, that is, give our very best. Nothing less in all 
in everything that we think, we say, and that we do, especially in all the things for the Lord. And as uh, Labor Day is upon us uh, for tomorrow, we can also think of the labor that we do for God and how we should do it as unto the Lord with a good heart attitude. And with that, let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you, again, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the holiday that we have tomorrow, for the reminder that uh, we celebrate the labor that man does for other mankind, for other jobs. But Father, as we look into a spiritual perspective of this, we also labor for you. We labor as unto you. Whenever we do anything, Father, we need to focus on the fact that whatever it is that we do, we do it as unto you and not to anyone else, not for our own glory, not for our own satisfaction, but for yours, to bring you honor, glory, and praise. And Father, I just pray that you help us as we go about our tasks each day uh, serving you. Father, I just lift each and every one before you. Wherever we go, whatever we do, I just pray that your will be done. Uh, we just ask your blessings on each and every one. Just pray for safety and travels wherever we may go. And Father, we just lift our heavenly family before you. Again, we ask your blessings on each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, with the various diseases and illnesses and everything coming upon us, uh, we do have... Uh, as mentioned earlier, we have the flu, we have COVID trying to leap back into our lives and everything else. Please do continue to stay safe, um, stay strong and healthy, and, and do whatever you need to do to uh, try and keep from getting that. Because uh, we want to see you again next week, Lord willing. Have a good week. God bless you all, and, and uh, enjoy your Labor Day. Take care.